Jesus, the grace that Lord gave us the opportunity to become part of the covenant. Jesus, the assurance of the salvation. Jesus, the life to the dead. Jesus, the promise to those who are on the journey. Speak to us this morning and use me as a vessel. And may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, my Lord and my Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Be quiet, come out, or be still and come out. Last Sunday, we saw Jesus setting out to, uh, to get his disciples, or to create the ministry, or to we would call may, maybe a search, searching for who is going to be in his ministry. And so we saw him going for Andrew. He went for uh, James. He went for John. He went for these children of Zebedee. He knew that these guys, they can do his ministry. And... Um, all he was trying to do was to make sure that the people who are, you know, who are going to take his ministry, this stewardship of ministry, are going to use the skills that they had since their childhood. So that was his mission. So in today's gospel, we see, we see him in the uh, Caponium synagogue. The synagogue was uh, a local church in a certain place where people used to go worship. Some used to go there three times a day, but the Jews used to go there at least on Sabbath. It was right in town. And the Jews made sure that that place, it was a place where they, they, they met God. It was a place where they went for confession. It was a place where they went to, you know, tell God what was going on. So Jesus, and it was open for, you know, the Jews who were in town. If you were a Jew and you're passing by, you have to go in the synagogue and worship. So what we are reading here in the Gospel of Mark chapter 1 is that Jesus is teaching. Happens to be nearby, went in that synagogue and he started teaching and he is with his disciples. But the people were astonished at his teaching because he taught them as one who had the authority. And I want us to emphasize and underline that. He taught as one who had authority and not as the scribes did, not as the Pharisees did, but this man was teaching as one who had authority. His, word had, his words had an extraordinary effect upon the congregation. And the astonishing thing about Jesus' teaching was that uh, he broke through the fog uh, that the, the, the scribes had created and he spoke with the bright clarity of the kingdom of heaven. He never, sometimes, you know, when you're talking, you, you, you may say, I don't want to be, uh, I, I don't want to be, you know, quoted differently. And some people want to become politically correct or whatever norm they want to. We want always to make sure that we underscore what the congregation wants. But this is not what Jesus Christ was teaching. Jesus was so clear that he broke through what the Pharisees said, the scribes said, but he was bringing the truth of the scripture. He spoke straight from God with a voice that penetrated the heart. Let me tell you how Paul describes, he says the word of Jesus is like a two double-edged sword. It pierces through the bone marrows. It doesn't just go in, it pierces, it is very sharp. 
That is how Paul understands, you know, the speaking of Jesus Christ. And so this guy spoke with authority. Let me tell you this. In the first reading, what did it say? That I am putting my word in the mouth of the prophet to go and proclaim it. And if you do proclaim, listen, if you proclaim the word that God did not give you, you will die. So if he has given you that word, it, that it is not yours. Go speak it the way it is. Do not reduce it. Do not justify it. Just to speak the way it is. That is what Jesus, that's how Jesus preached. So I want to ask you, with the few just remarks I made, can you hear him today speaking to you? Can you hear him say, get over it yourself? Stop pretending and playing games. Can you hear him speak in your mind? Say, maybe you're saying, oh, I don't want to hear that. You know, the truth pains. Do you know that? The truth pains. If you have a dear friend that tells you the truth, guess what? You do not want to visit that person often because the truth pains. We always like to brag and talk and whatever it is. But some people, when they hear the truth, the beginning come, begins, beginning to come in or setting in, they say, stop it. Some may say, stop, you know, maybe they want to shut Jesus and say, stop your mouth. But Jesus Christ said, I don't want to hear your complaint. I don't want to hear your praises. I don't want you, to, even if you rebuke me, you, even if you soothe me with whatever words you, you want to say, dear Jesus, you are awesome, you're wonderful, you are, you, you are spectacular, you are a dear Lord, you are fantastic. You can say whatever you want to say. But if he is not a Jesus that reigns in your heart, those words are falling on a hard rock. He is speaking to the people. We cannot stop him when he speaks. And we cannot stop him when he wants to do whatever he wants to do. We cannot restrain him. And that's why he says, be still. And come out. That's a command. I want you to take these two words themselves and put them together and see how those verbs are very strong and dynamic. They're so powerful. You know, it's not easy just to go out there and you find a convulsed person with the evil spirit and you say, be quiet. But I think sometimes when the needs gets you know, sometimes we have to come up and shout out and say, be quiet, be still, get out. We no longer have preachers who can rebuke the evil. He said, now we just fight. I'm telling you, if you want to fight the devil, you don't just go say, hey, baby, it will be fine. The, de the devil doesn't, the devil is so powerful, man. If you want to fight the devil to get out of you, you don't just go chilling. And, uh, no, you have to go with the power. And where do you get that resource? And now, you know, we, we are in a situation whereby we have to be so soft, so cool, so nice, so that people can pat on our shoulder and say, you'll be all right. And then we go into a sleeping mall. Yeah. And then, you know, we call that a church. No way. <laughs> Jesus astonishes us with his straight talk from heaven to the heart. If you don't feel it, I don't know where you are. If you cannot hear him, I don't know where your ears are. 
You know, his words have authority. And what kind of authority is this? The disciples themselves are wondering where Jesus is getting the authority. Man, what kind of this man is? Where does he get authority? In the first reading, again, I want to take you in Deuteronomy chapter 18, we had the Lord God saying that he would rise up a great prophet from among the people of Israel. That great prophet is Jesus, the son of God who came in the flesh and incarnated amidst us and his name is Emmanuel. And he came with that prophetic power that he will put his mouth in his mouth, his word in his mouth, in that he shall speak to the house of Israel and all that God commands. That is what the Old Testament told us this morning. That's when Jesus Christ speaks, he speaks with authority and power because his words are the spirit filled, life giving, powerful, effective, creative words of God. And when we hear the words of Jesus, we don't remain the same because they get us out of where we are into a different destiny. They take us from our fear. And they bring us to that hope. They take all our anxiety and fills us. That is what we want to hear. The authority of Jesus Christ is omnipotent, all-powerful, and efficacious word of grace. He calls and the things come. He commands and the things are done. He orders things go away. He only needs to say a word and everything is reduced to silence. This power, all omnipotence of Jesus, is the same power that rose Lazarus from the dead just by calling him, Lazarus, come out. And they were complaining, he's dead four days, he will be stinking, he cannot come out. That is the fear of the people who are in the funeral. But Jesus Christ said, we can change this funeral into a revival. Someone is dead, not Lazarus. Lazarus is not dead, but you who are in the funeral, you are dead. Lazarus, come out. And you remain in the grave. The power that I'm talking about, the same power that healed the woman who was bleeding for 12 years. She only said, I can't even speak to Jesus. If I only touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be well. That is the power I'm talking about. That is the source of our healing that I'm talking about. The same power that I'm talking about is the same power that calmed the storm when the disciples were in the boat, they were about to perish. They called Jesus who was sleeping in the back of the boat and they said, don't you care? And what did he say? <laughs> what did he say? He rose up, he told the wind, he told the tsunami and says, be still. <laughs> Be still. Yes. And Hallelujah. what happened to the disciples? Everything was quiet. Yes. You have to invite Jesus Christ to come the storm in your life. He knows what is going on, but you have been quiet. You've never invited him to quiet that storm. How is he going to do it? Invite him. And Jesus Christ quieted. This is the power I'm talking about this morning. I'm talking about the power, not only the ones that come to the storm. What about, let me remind you, if you are the good reader of the Old Testament, do you know our three brothers, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who told uh, Nebuchadnezzar and said, King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't care whether you are creating a furnace fire 
for us to die. But the power, listen to this, the power of the living God in whom we believe in will save us from the furnace fire. That is the power I'm talking about. And when they were thrown in, what happened? Oh, the fire did nothing to these brothers. And the king said, I threw in three guys. Now I see the fourth one. Who was the fourth? Jesus was in there. So when you have the power, when you have that power, the fire can do nothing. The storm can do nothing because he shields you. And Nebuchadnezzar had to say, from now on, I believe <laughs> the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The reason the people are not coming to Jesus is because we, 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 who call ourselves Christians, we have become a stumbling block of the word of God. It's no longer powerful. We have weakened it, the way we believe, the way we behave. We no longer show the Jesus life in us. The power I'm talking about, if you can remember, let me give you just another person. You remember our brother Daniel? who was thrown in the den of lion just because the king was not happy of what he said. What happened to the lions? They looked at him, they sneezed on him, and they said, this man is holy, he doesn't deserve to die. The power of God shut the lion's mouth and they never consumed David. That's the power I'm talking about. The power I'm talking about is the power that Jesus Christ invited a criminal on Good Friday when he was hanged on the cross and said, Jesus, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And the man said, I will be with you in paradise. That is the power. That is salvation. That is revival. That is a church. It is a wonder working power of Jesus I'm preaching this morning. Therefore, we are not surprised that when Jesus Christ spoke, even the evil spirit were thrown into chaos. They went in, into panic. And Jesus' words captivated that spirit and the spirit said, are you coming to destroy us? Now, be careful now. Because in verse 23, just then we read that just then in the synagogue, a man with an clean spirit. Now, maybe you, you, you didn't hear me right. Where was the man? In the synagogue. We're not reading that it was on the street. We're not reading that it was in the bar. He was in the church. So do you want to tell me that even the people with unclean spirit come in the congregations? And why, why is it that they, they come with those evil spirits and they go back with them? What happened? This guy was in the church. And then he said, the spirit immediately recognized that the guy who a preacher who was preaching that day was different from many other preachers he has ever seen. And that's why he said, have you come to destroy us? Us means there were many. It was not one, only one man. I know who you are. <laughs> now I want you to register this with me. The spirit recognized who? They recognized Jesus, but the congregation in the church never recognized Jesus. Woo! They could not recognize the power of the healing Christ. What's wrong with you guys? What went wrong? They, they said, we know who you are. Then they even described, they did not say, they said, you are the Holy One of God. What is interesting here, of course, is that the evil spirit knew who Jesus was, but the religious teachers of the law, 
had not figured out themselves who Jesus was. How ironic it is for the scribes, for the Sadducees, for the Pharisees to have missed the truth in the midst and yet a man with unclean spirit recognized Jesus and the Savior. And that's why you may have a someone preach to you, someone say amen. Another one said, what did he say? I didn't understand it. That's true. Something just passed by because it was not your choice. The demonic man knew Jesus' name. He says, Jesus of Nazareth. He knew Jesus' identity. I know who you are, the Holy One of God, verse 24. He knew the correct formula to use when addressing Jesus. His understanding was far deeper than anyone else in the congregation was. Think about this. Here he cries out, why have you come to do with us? In other words, have mercy on me. And yet, you who claim to be a Christian for a long, long time, do not even understand the identity of God. I used to have a neighbor who claimed to be a friend. Every time you used to ask me, where are you from? In the South, that's a very common word. Where are you from? I'm from Uganda. The next up, after about five months, he says, where are you from? I'm from Uganda. After two years, where are you from? Are you from Uganda? And then whenever I visited him, he would introduce me to his friends, you know, and said, oh, uh, this is a preacher, Episcopal uh, preacher who is our neighbor here. He comes from Bahamas. And I say, oh, you're from Bahamas? I say, yeah. <laughs> you know, I have been telling this guy five years where I'm coming from, and he cannot even pick it up, <laughs> you know. And then he, he would ask me, are you married? I say, yes, I have, I'm married, I have children. Hey, are you married? And the next, yes, I am married, I have children. He say, ah, oh, yeah, uh, a preacher, you know, he's not married, you know. <laughs> you know, one day I went to visit their church. He stands up to tell the congregation to a Latin series we are sharing and he's introducing me. He says, oh, William comes from the, he came here on, uh, on a political asylum. I say, oh, no, 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 no. I had to change my, my, my introduction to correct everything he said because it was wrong. A neighbor that I've been with, how many years? Many years, but he could not understand who I am. So the reason I'm saying this, it's not about just coming to church every Sunday and attending the church. But if you don't know the identity of Jesus Christ, you are missing the mark. So let me ask you a question. How many years had this man been attending the church and nobody cared about him? He probably showed up every Sabbath because it seems the congregation knew who he was, but they did not understand him. Yes, you can know who I am, but you may not understand exactly who I am. Let me just probably put it this way. This man, his senses, the distance between his life and Jesus. He breaks out from isolation. He interprets Jesus' teaching. He shouts for help. He is not alone. He speaks out not only for himself, but on behalf of others. What about you? Look at the action. Salvation does not find you sitting. You have to take a step of faith and move. We all, let me tell you this. This man, the Bible describes him as a, a, a demoniac person. He was evil. He was he, he, he had evil spirits in him. We all come with our own internal struggle. We all have our own 
demons. We have our own demons. Now, when we describe a demon, you think that it is a, a devil with a sharp teeth, with the horns on the... No, we have those demons that we have in ourselves that are eating us and killing us and killing us. We don't even want people to know about. We have anger that is killing us. We have resentments that is killing us. We have guilt and fears that is killing us. We isolate ourselves because what we've been doing or what we are doing is inhuman. We don't want people to know. Those small demons, you know, you have this one and then the, another demon comes up, another demon comes up, another demon comes up. When they pile in you, what, what happens? You become crazy. Some of us may be struggling with anxiety and depression or maybe even substance abuse. Our demons may be loneliness. Our demons may be grief and failed relationships. Our demons may be a struggle with perfectionism or self-doubt. Our demons may be related to something that happened to us long time ago. Something we can't seem to move past. When we say, let go, you say, oh, oh, not now. Our demons are hurting us. And we seem not to be healed. And we can't even find a solace in them. But this morning, I was inviting you. If you can be like this guy, identify that Jesus Christ is here and you want to place your demons behind you, and you want to cast them out, I want you to identify. There is only one redeemer. There is a redeemer. Jesus is the only one who can touch us. The redeemer, as we, we sang in the, first, in the last stanza of the first hymn that we sang, he is the only redeemer who can get us out of those Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Yes, we have our demons. Let me conclude by asking you as a church member, if you understand where your situation is, bring it to Jesus. There is power in him. His word is like a double-edged sword. There is nothing that is impossible with him. Just behave like this woman who was bleeding for 12 years, out of her shame, she said, if I can only touch the hem of Jesus, just behave like Mary and Martha who said, our brother is dead, but if you were here, I think he wouldn't have died. That was a kind of a step of faith. Just be like a guy who said, sir, if you can only speak the word, my child will get well. If you can have that little faith in you, then the demons in you will just vanish. I like to imagine this because don't fear the demons have no power. They only come, surround you, scare you, and then dem demobilizes you. And once they are in there, they control you. You can't go anywhere. So I invite you now. Count <laughs> how many demons you have. Put them on the list and let this banish them right now. Kick them off. It is only, you know, it is only him who can, you know, we used to sing a song that says, there is power. Power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. It is that power that I want you to have. So that power you use to kick out the demon that has been controlling you. This is what should be, we should do when the unnamed person comes in our church and sits there and we do not know that person a long, long time. So we should let ourselves be 
wounded healers that we are meant to be. Let the, our church be a sanctuary to those who have demons to come in and heal. I always tell people that we don't come to church because we are righteous. We don't come to church because we are putting on the right garment. We don't come to church because we know how to read and write. We come to church because we are seeking Jesus. So I challenge us. There's only two words, two verbs. If you can hear them, then you'll be fine. The first one says, be quiet. Another one says, get out. If you can get that, you rebuke the devil in your prayer. When you're praying in your own situation, when you get into prayer, tell the devil, be quiet, get out. Don't just say, be quiet devil. <laughs> just give me five minutes. I'll be right back. Tell the devil rebuke with power and then you'll be healed. Amen. Amen. Thank Jesus, you. Jesus, we come before you this morning to give you thanks and praise. We want to identify ourselves with the guy who came in the church with the demons. And we ask you, Father, if there is any demon in this church in the name of Jesus, that your power should go out in there and uproot it. If there is anything that is engulfing us and not letting us, our eyes to see you, we ask you, Father, that you open our eyes. We ask you to redeem your church and revive it and give us the word that will penetrate through the bone marrows. In Jesus Christ, the Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.